And for those that are uh, staying here, why don't you go ahead and take your Bibles and open to the book of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. The title of the message today is Election and Inclusion as we continue uh, the series entitled Reading Romans Backwards, which is inspired, of course, by the book of Romans, but also Scott McKnight, uh, who recently released a book entitled Reading Romans Backwards. And in that, he says, you know, really the core message of the book of Romans is chapters 12 through 16. And that's where we find what he calls a living theology or our praxis. It's how we live out following Jesus in the world, in community with each other, and as our witness and our way in the world itself. And then chapters 1 through 11, which we are beginning to turn to now, uh, as we continue to read backwards, going starting with chapter 9 now, we've been in chapter 12 through 16. He says chapters 1 through 11 really are the points that support the main message. So we're going to hear some of those points, some of those arguments that support what we've been talking about in chapters 12 through 16 of what it means to live the way of Christ in community and in the world. The setting, as a reminder, is that uh, Jewish Christians are returning to Rome after a time of being expelled. And Rome probably has the largest population of Jewish Christians outside of Israel in the first century. They're coming back and they have found that the church has continued to grow in their absence, but it has grown among, of course, Gentile believers. And these Gentile believers are not Jewish converts. Now, there were Jewish converts among Gentile believers. They were called God-fearers. And there were people who had converted to Judaism, worshipped the one true God, Yahweh, and they practiced the law, they practiced the dietary laws, they practiced uh, observing the holy days. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about Gentile Christians who were not Jewish converts first. They have come to Christ and they know very little about Judaism and have very little commitment to Jewish law. Maybe even none. This is causing a problem because Christianity is growing and everyone's just trying to figure out exactly what it is and what it's supposed to look like. And the Jewish Christians have a certain idea and it's really just a continuation of Judaism for them, but with the embrace of Jesus as Messiah. So they're still practicing their laws and all their other observances and believe that the Gentiles should be like the old God-fearers that came into Judaism and do the same. And the Gentiles that are Christians want nothing to do with this. It's causing an issue. McKnight says, the social structure of the churches was no longer the same. A non-Torah observance culture had formed. Tensions arose. Paul labels the parties strong and weak, terms that were as much about status and power and privilege as about religious practice, end quote. Now, we've noted that issues of power and privilege run throughout the book of Romans from beginning to end. But this book is not mainly concerned with issues of power and privilege. Those dividing issues must be dealt with in order to get to the main objective. And the main objective is creating a community of peace. McKnight entitles chapters 9 through 11, A Narrative Leading to Peace. Paul does not want this newly emerging Christian community to miss the bus. If this community is not defined by peace, then it's just another Jewish faction. And there's already plenty of those in existence at the time. Let's begin by reading Romans 9, 1 through 9. It says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. And from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, 
It is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Let's stop there for the moment. Now, Carla tells me that when she was a kid, uh, she chronically missed the bus. And her dad would have to drive her a couple blocks down the street to her uncle's house and he would give her a ride to school on his way to work, although you said it wasn't really on his way to work, right? <laughs> now, Carla was pretty lucky that she didn't grow up in my house because there was no bus that stopped by our house. And we were under what at the time was a two-mile radius, just under it, and we had to walk, you know the story, we had to walk uphill both ways, <laughs> right, to get to school. And my parents, it never occurred to them to give us a ride <laughs> to school. And so, you, didn't, you know, there was no bus to miss at my house. But if there was, I don't think I would have missed it. I would have made sure I got on it. Now, Paul is kind of talking about missing a bus here. Paul is grieved. Israel has waited and anticipated the coming of a Messiah for many, many years. They have searched the scriptures and they figured it all out so that when it happens, they'll know and they won't miss it. The problem is they figured it out so well that they completely missed it because you never really have God figured out, do you? Just when you think you've cornered the market, he changes something and he does something in a different way than anticipated. So don't ever think that you've got God figured out because you might end up missing the bus. One of the issues causing division among the Christians in Rome is that some people feel like they have more favor with God than others. The Jewish Christians saw themselves as God's people and that they had God's seal of approval on them. And Paul affirms their incredible history. In verse four, he essentially says, yes, God has indeed adopted you as his own. You saw his glory, the fire by night and the cloud by day as he led you out of Egypt through the wilderness toward the promised land. You have the covenants He established his covenant with you. You have the Ten Commandments. To you it was given. And you've got the law that shows you how to live his way in the world. He says that with you, God has dwelled. Not in the many temples that you could have found in Rome in that day or in the rest of the pagan world, but in the one temple in Jerusalem was the one place where God's presence had showed up tangibly and where he could be found to worship in a tangible way. He says, to you were given the promises and sealed with God's seal. For yours is the history, he says, through which Christ came to be and was birthed in Jesus. But then he says, don't get stuck in the past. So often we want to hold on to what was. We always look back fondly on the old days, don't we? I don't know when in history you'd like to return to, I always thought about if I could choose any time to go back to. I remember a day when I was 17 and I just felt like I was on top of the world. I felt like, uh, you know, a young Augustus or a young Alexander the Great who could conquer the world. And so I always felt that when I get to heaven, I think God's going to let me be 17 again. I don't know where you want to go back to in history. But the problem is, is that we can't go back, can we? Uh, Over the years, as we raise our children, I can't count how many times people have told us, cherish these years, because they go by so fast. And it hit me the other day when I was filling out some applications for the older kids as they're getting ready to do some dual enrollment. uh, And it said, when are they going to graduate high school? And I wrote 2022, and it dawned on me that that's not very far away. (laughs) And then yesterday, uh, Zeke was backed the car out of the garage and was honking for me to come because I was supposed to take him to work because he can't drive alone yet. And I'm looking out the window at him. And I'm like, my little Zeker Beaker is honking the horn at me. <laughs> oh, and he's driving a car. He's, driving, he's honking for me to hurry up. Oh. I remember a song that you might remember, and this is actually from a ways back now. It's a Steve Miller band, 
And in the song, it has a line, time keeps on slipping into the future. Yes, Israel, all these memories, all these realities, they are yours. Understand that all of that led up to this very moment in history. And know that it was always meant to move forward from here, not remain stuck. Let's continue reading in Romans 9, 25 and 26. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called sons of the living God. Paul here is taking something from Hosea that was once applied to Israel, and now he's applying it to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. What Israel didn't realize is that they were riding a double-decker bus. Have you ever ridden a double-decker bus? It's great fun. Uh, my first experience riding a double-decker bus was in Ireland. And me and Pastor Leo, that's us up there. We, we got on this double-decker bus and we had to go find the car rental place. And uh, as we got on, we, you know, what I wanted to do, because if you go on a double-decker bus, you want to go up on the top. And there was hardly anyone up on the top because I guess if you're used to these, then you like to be on the bottom where it's very easy to get in and out. But we wanted to go on the top and the front seats were open. And so we went and sat in the very front seats and we had a good time. Uh, and well, I know when we got on, uh, we were asking questions because we had never ridden a bus and we never used euros before. And of course they wanted exact change. And so the bus driver was kind of frustrated with us as we figured out how many euros that would cost. And uh, we're, we asked him, where exactly are we going to get off? Do you know this car rental place? And you know, the guy knows all of Ireland, but you know how many car rental places there must be? And so he's trying to say, well, maybe you should get off here or there. But we can tell he's kind of irritated at these foreigners, right? That don't know their way around, don't know the system, don't know how to count the money. And they're real excited to get to the top of the double-decker bus. And so nonetheless, we got on. Now, Paul is in these verses is saying and telling to the Jewish Christians, adopting Gentiles was always part of the plan. You're riding a double-decker bus. And these Gentiles, they're getting on with you. Now, they're going to go up to the upper deck and they're going to check out the front seats. And yes, they belong here too. It's okay. But Paul is sad and the Jewish Christians are mad because so many of the Jewish people aren't getting on the bus. And so we pick up in verse 30 and 32 of chapter 9. What then shall we say? that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued the law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. Let's stop there. Now, it's not as though the Gentiles have taken the place of the Jewish people. There's plenty of room on the bus. I mean, it's a double-decker bus after all. It's kind of like faulting migrants for taking American jobs, right? Now, we all know that that guy over there ain't out of work because there's not any jobs for him. And he probably wouldn't have been doing that job anyway, right? There are plenty of jobs. He just doesn't want that one. So let's not blame hardworking migrants on what has come to be American self-entitlement. There is room on the bus for all of the people, for the people of Israel, for the Gentiles. They just don't want to get on. But these foreigners, they're allowed to ride this bus because their money is good here. Their currency is faith, and those are the right coins. You see, God's plan is always bigger than ours. God's scope is always broader and his vision is always larger. There's space on this train for Mahatma Gandhi. There's room on this bus for Rosa Parks. And when it comes to Christianity, there's plenty of room 
for anyone who wants to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Nothing about their election, Paul says, diminishes yours. And the history and the relationships that you share with God still matter. But your story, he's saying, was never meant to be the end of history. The beginning of someone else's story takes up here. Your story was always meant to bring about their new beginning. In evangelicalism, we call this evangelism, right? That we're to be a light to the world that brings light to others. Your election, he's saying, was meant to be and to lead toward their inclusion. You're not just riding any older, any old bus. In fact, you're on something akin to the magic school bus. Anyone remember the magic school bus? Yes, we'll get to that soon. Let's go ahead and read chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. It says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The word of the Lord. Now here, Paul reveals that Israel has been trying to earn their salvation. But this, of course, is impossible. Nobody earns their salvation. One of the ways I was thinking, how can we kind of put ourselves in the place of these Jewish Christians who aren't going to like to hear this very much? And I thought of a, a, a modern example of this. And I don't want to step on any toes, but I think that uh, there's a whole other side to this story. And it might help us to understand the perspective of the Jewish Christians and why they wrestle with this. I want to talk about Medicare for a minute. Because I hear a lot of people saying, it's not an entitlement, I paid for that. Well, I want to give you a few statistics. And I want to show you how grace is involved in this system. And that we didn't necessarily earn this either. So Forbes magazine published an article and they showed how much is typically paid into the Medicare system and how much is actually taken out of it by the individual. And they said, a male earning an average wage over his lifetime will pay about $61,000 into Medicare, but they will receive $180,000 worth of benefits or medical care from it, which means they've earned about one third of their Medicare benefits. Now a female who on average will live longer, well, over their lifetime, they'll, or they'll receive about $207,000 worth of benefits, but they'll have paid about the same amount into the system, which is about $61,000. Now, that means that they're going to be able to receive about $146,000 more than they actually paid in. Do you see that there's grace involved here? Right? We paid into the system, but with the advances in medical treatment and the cost of medical skyrocketing, there is no way that the average person, myself, would be able to pay enough in to actually be able to say that I've covered those costs. The first heart surgery I have will mean that I'm already receiving much more than I ever paid in over my lifetime. So maybe that hits with a little bit of, uh, understand that that's how the Jewish Christians are gonna hear this. Wait a second, I paid in. I lived by the law. My ancestors put into this time, all this time, and now these Gentiles get to jump onto the system? Hmm. It's just to suggest that grace and benevolence may be involved offends the self-esteem of many. And it was offending the Jewish Christians of this time. In verse 3, Paul says that, Paul's countrymen said that they were seeking to establish their own righteousness, rather than stoop to receive what God was freely giving through Jesus Christ. In other words, the righteousness that they had was self-righteousness. And self-righteousness in the kingdom of God is always a debt, not a contribution. Instead, Christ's own righteousness is freely distributed to those who recognize God's goodness and grace toward them. Those who recognize Christ's merits above their own. When my kids were younger, they, 
we'd read the magic school bus to them. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a, about an eccentric teacher, Miss Frizzle. And she takes her classroom on learning adventures and they have to climb aboard the magic school bus. And the magic school bus is more than just a bus. I mean, it can become an airplane. It can become a submarine. It can become a spaceship. It can become microscopic. And in order to enter the places that it needs to go to teach these kids the lessons that they need to learn in an engaging way, they can get on this bus and they can explore faraway places like the Arctic or space or the depths of the sea, or even the anatomy of the human body from the inside. It's a magical school bus. And the kids don't do anything to make it happen. They just have to get in the school bus and allow it to happen for them. In verses 1 through 4 of chapter 10, Paul is saying that the Jewish people, they're trying to get to God on their own. That's like trying to get to the Arctic on a non-magical school bus. Once it hits the water, it's going to sink. And because it can't turn into a submarine, it's going to fill up. That's the predicament that Paul's countrymen are in. In verse 3, he says, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. The only way to bridge the distance between heaven and earth, between humanity and God, is Christ. Verse 4 says, He is the righteousness that is the vehicle for everyone who believes. The end of the law. And it's really important to understand what it means that Christ is the end of the law uh, because it doesn't mean exactly what we might take it to mean at face value. Clinton Arnold, a New Testament scholar, scholar writes, and it'll be up on the screen. He says, the English word end is ambiguous, but it can be taken to mean termination, as in the end of class finally came. The Greek word here, telos, however, has the added nuance of goal. Paul presents Christ as both the end and goal of the law, much like the finish line of a race course. When the runner reaches that finish line, the race is ended, but crossing the finish line is also the goal. So God intended all along that the law would find its end and goal, its climax or culmination in Christ. He ends the era of the law's rule, even as he ushers in the times of fulfillment to which the law itself always pointed. He's telling the Jewish people, this isn't just the end like thing the law has done, but it's the fulfillment. This is what it all led to. This is how we got here. Paul's argument is not about individual salvation, which unfortunately, since the Protestant Reformation, we've made these texts all about individual salvation. Who's predestined, who's not? Uh, that is a very Western idea. This whole idea of individualism and that some are selected and some are not. The first century world, the Jewish people and those in the Mediterranean did not think in terms of individuals. They thought in terms of groups. So the argument that we use for individual predestination uh, or those that are individually destined for hell, uh, that really isn't an argument that was going on in the first century. That was new with Western civilization and the rise of individualism, uh, which we are still deeply embedded in today. Now, there were certainly talk about election and predestination, but it always had to do with groups of people. And the Pharisees talked about things like predestination and um, meticulous sovereignty, not in those words, things like that. Uh, we have various Jewish groups. The Pharisees uh, believe this. They believe that some things were predetermined and some things were open. They were left to chance or your choice or your decision. Now, the Sadducees, they had a different take on these issues. They said that there's no such thing as fate. Everything has to do with choices and consequences from those choices. Whereas the Essenes said that fate was the mistress of all things. Everything is predetermined. God would not leave anything to chance. But the thing is, Paul isn't really debating any of these issues. He's simply saying Christ is the way. And God has provided Christ for us. And he is a gift to all who will receive him. That's what he's trying to help them to understand. And the challenge for us is, who are the people that we don't really want on our bus? Who are the people that we don't think belong? And maybe God is challenging us as well, that there's room on the bus for them, because it's a double-decker bus. 
and you will see faces glaring out the front of that double-decker bus that you never imagined might be there. And it's okay. Let's make space. Let's make room for them. Let's get past our prejudices and our conclusions about how things have to happen. God is able. Let's pray.